In this video, we'll learn how to implement a convolutional neural network from scratch using Keras. Here we show a simple CNN architecture that will learn how to model from scratch in Keras and train it on a small data set called CIFAR10. We'll also use this as an opportunity to introduce a new layer type called dropout, which is often used in models to mitigate the effects of overfitting. We have quite a bit of material to cover in this video, so before we dive into the details, let's just preview the main topics that we're going to cover. We're going to start by loading the CIFAR10 dataset and displaying some of the sample images from the dataset. We're then going to move on to pre-processing the dataset and setting some data and training configuration parameters. Then we're going to introduce a simple CNN architecture and we'll cover how to implement this model in Keras. We'll show that our initial trained model overfits the training data as shown in these plots. And then we're going to move on to adjusting the model by adding dropout layers. We'll show that adding dropout layers helps the model generalize better to unseen data while improving the model's accuracy on the validation data set. After training the model for a second time, we'll then show you how you can save a trained model to the file system and then load it back into memory and continue using it. And then finally, we'll cover several methods for how to evaluate the model's accuracy on the test data set. We'll show you how you can use individual samples from the test data set to make predictions and display the results. And we'll conclude with a discussion on the confusion matrix. So let's go ahead and get started. We first need to import several Python and TensorFlow packages. And notice that we're importing several layer types that we're going to use further below to implement the model. We're also setting a random number seed here so that the results in this notebook are repeatable. So let's first introduce the CIFAR10 dataset, which contains small color images from 10 different classes as shown here. The images have a spatial size of 32 by 32, and the total number of images in the dataset is 60,000. So this is a manageable size dataset to work with from the standpoint of the runtime required to train a small model. Since the CIFAR10 dataset is included in the TensorFlow distribution, we can load the dataset directly using the load data function as shown in the code cell below. Once a dataset is loaded, it's always a good idea to inspect some of the images. Remember the images in this dataset are quite small, only 32 pixels by 32 pixels. So while they don't have a lot of detail as shown in the samples below, there's still enough information in these images to support an image classification task. In this next section, we normalize the image data to the range 0 to 1. This is very common when working with image data, which helps the model to train more efficiently. We also convert the integer labels to one-hot encoded labels, as discussed in previous videos. Before we describe the model implementation and training, we're going to apply a little more structure to our training process. Here we use the Data Classes module in Python to create two simple classes to organize several data and training configuration parameters. The benefit of doing this is that we now have a single place to go to make any desired changes. In this section, we'll define a simple CNN model in Keras and train it on the CIFAR10 dataset. Recall from a previous video the following steps in which we define a network model using predefined layers in Keras, compile the model using the compile method, and then training the model with the fit method. However, before we get into the coding details, let's first take a look at the general structure of the model we're proposing. Notice that the model has a similar structure to VGG16, but has fewer layers and a much smaller input image size, and therefore fewer trainable parameters. The model contains three convolutional blocks, followed by a fully connected layer and a fully connected output layer. For reference, we've included the number of channels at key points in the architecture, and also the spatial size of the activation maps at the end of each convolutional block. This is a good visual that you can refer back to when studying the code below. For convenience, we're going to define the model in a function, and we've highlighted the convolutional layers in the diagram so that you can follow along. Notice that the function has one optional argument, which is the input shape to the model. We first start by instantiating the model by calling the sequential method. This allows us to build the model sequentially by adding one layer at a time. Notice that we define three convolutional blocks and that their structure is very similar. Let's start with the very first convolutional layer in the first convolutional block. 
To define a convolutional layer in Keras, we call the conv2d function, which takes several input arguments. First, we define the layer to have 32 filters. The kernel size for each filter is 3, which is interpreted as 3 by 3. We use a padding option called same, which will pad the input tensor so that the output of the convolution operation has the same spatial size as the input. This is not required, but it's commonly used. If you don't explicitly specify this padding option, then the default behavior has no padding, and therefore the spatial size of the output from the convolutional layer will be slightly smaller than the input size, assuming you use a stride of 1, which is the default for this layer type. For all the layers in the network other than the output layer, we're going to use a ReLU activation function. And then for the very first convolutional layer, we need to specify the shape of the input, but for all subsequent layers, this is not necessary since the shape of the input is automatically computed based on the shape of the output from previous layers. So we have two convolutional layers with 32 filters each. And then we follow that with a max pooling layer that has a window size of 2 by 2. So the output shape from this first convolutional block is going to be 16 by 16 by 32. Next, we have a second convolutional block which is nearly identical to the first one with the exception that we have 64 filters in each convolutional layer instead of 32. And then finally, the third convolutional block is an exact copy of the second convolutional block. Before we define the fully connected layers in the classifier, we need to first flatten the activation maps from the last convolutional layer in the network. Notice these have a shape of 4x4 four four with 64 channels. To do this, we call the flatten function, which creates a one-dimensional vector of length 1024. We then add a fully connected dense layer with 512 neurons, followed by another fully connected layer with 10 neurons, which represent the 10 outputs from the classifier. Also notice that the activation function for the last layer is softmax. But keep in mind that the output of all 10 neurons pass through the softmax function to normalize the data between 0 and 1. So even though this function is referred to as an activation function, it's applied differently than the ReLU activation functions defined elsewhere in the network, which apply to every single neuron in those respective layers. Now that we've defined this function, we can create the model by calling the function as shown in the next code cell. And then we can also print the summary of the model by calling the summary method. This confirms for us the size and shape of each of the layers and the total number of trainable parameters associated with the model. As you can see, there are about 670,000 trainable parameters, which is on the smaller side for most models. Just for comparison purposes, VGG16 has a total of 138 million parameters. So VGG16 is about 200 times larger than the model that we're going to train here. The next step is to compile the model, which is where we specify the type of optimizer to use, the loss function, and any additional metrics that we'd like to record during training. Here we specify RMSProp as the optimizer type for gradient descent, and we use a cross-entropy loss function, which is the standard loss function for classification problems. We specifically use categorical cross-entropy since our labels are one-hot encoded. Finally, we specify accuracy as an additional metric to record during the training process. The value of the loss function is always recorded by default, but if you want accuracy, you need to specify it. We're now ready to train the model with the fit method as we've demonstrated in previous videos. Even though the model is different from previous videos, the arguments to the fit method remain the same. We first supply the images and the labels from the training data set. Next, we specify the batch size and the number of training epochs, but notice that rather than hard coding those values, we use the training config class to specify those values. As we've shown previously, since the data set does not include a validation data set, and since we did not previously split the training data set to create a validation data set, we use the validation split argument below so that 30% of the training data set is automatically reserved for validation. In this case, this approach reserves the last 30% of the training data set for validation. But if the training data set has any specific ordering, say for example ordered by classes, you'll need to take steps to randomize the data set first before using this validation split argument. Notice that the fit method returns a history object that contains the data recorded during training. We'll access the data in this object so that we can plot the loss and accuracy during training in the next section below. So let's scroll down and take a look at the results.
As shown in both training plots, the results from our baseline model reveal that the model is overfitting. Notice that the validation loss starts increasing after about 10 epochs of training, while the training loss continues to decline. This means that the network has learned how to model the training data very well, but does not generalize well to unseen data. The accuracy plot shows a similar trend where the validation accuracy levels off after about 10 epochs, while the training accuracy continues to approach 100% as training progresses. This is a common problem when training neural networks and can occur for a number of reasons. One reason is that the model can fit the nuances of the training data set, especially when the training data set is small and the model has the capacity to learn such intricacies. To help mitigate the overfitting problem, we can employ one or more regularization strategies to help the model generalize better. Many regularization techniques help to restrict the model's flexibility so that it doesn't overfit the training data. One approach to achieve this effect is called dropout, which is built into Keras. Dropout is implemented in Keras as a special layer type that randomly drops a percentage of neurons during the training process. This technique has the effect of limiting the flexibility of the model. In the diagram below, we add a dropout layer at the end of each convolutional block and also after the first dense layer in the classifier. The input argument to the dropout function is the fraction of neurons to randomly drop from the previous layer during the training process. As we'll see in the code below, adding a dropout layer is trivial. Here we define a new model that contains a total of four dropout layers as depicted in the figure. In the first three dropout layers, we drop 25% of the neurons and in the last dropout layer, we raise that value to 50%. The more dropout layers used and the higher the fraction dropped, the more pronounced the effect will be. So at some point, the model will lose the ability to perform well on the training data, which is not what we want either. Rather, we'd like to strike a balance between performing well on the training data and performing equally well, or nearly as well, on the validation data set. There's nothing particularly special about these values or the decision to include a dropout layer at each of these locations. A lot of these settings come down to best practices based on what other people have found works well and also based on your own experimentation. Since we've only made a small change to a new model, all the other steps required to compile and train the model are the same, so we'll proceed directly to the training plots and have a look at those. As you can see, the training and validation curves for both loss and accuracy track each other nicely, which is one feature we'd like to see in a well-trained model. But that's not enough. We also want to make sure that the validation accuracy is higher than it was in the previous model. And indeed, that's the case here. Previously, the validation accuracy was about 70%. And now we see that the updated model with dropout achieves a validation accuracy closer to 80%, which represents a significant improvement. Before we proceed with evaluating the model on the test data set, we're going to cover one more new topic regarding saving and loading models, which is very convenient. This enables you to develop and train a model, save it to the file system, and then reload it at some future time for use. You can easily save a model using the save method, which will save the model to the file system in the saved model format. This method creates a folder on the file system. Within this folder, the model architecture and training configuration, including the optimizer, losses, and metrics, are stored in the specified file with a PB extension. In this case, model underscore dropout dot PB. This is also known as a protobuf format. The variables folder contains a standard training checkpoint file that includes the weights of the model. For now, let's save the trained model and then we'll load it back into memory in the next code cell with a different model name, reloaded underscore model underscore dropout, just to confirm that all subsequent processing is performed using the model that was read in from the file system. With our newly loaded model, let's now continue on with evaluating the model on the test data set. There are several things that we can do to evaluate the trained model further. We can compute the model's accuracy on the test data set. We can visually inspect the results on a subset of the images in a data set. And we can plot the confusion matrix for a data set. Let's take a look at all three examples. Evaluating the model's accuracy on the test data set can be computed with a single line of code as shown below. Here we use the model to call the evaluate method, passing in the images and the labels for the test data set. 
This method returns for us the value of the loss function for the test data set and the accuracy. Here we can see that the accuracy on the test data set is 78.3%. In this next section, we can use the model's predict method to make predictions on a small batch of data. For this purpose, we create a convenience function that accepts two required arguments, which are a data set and a model. This function retrieves a specified number of samples from the provided data set, calls the model's predict method, and then processes the predictions so that each sample image is displayed in the console along with the ground truth label and the predicted label. If the prediction is incorrect, we color code the labels in red to indicate the error. In the next code cell, we call this function with the test data set and the model that we trained with dropout. So let's go ahead and scroll down and take a look at the results below for 18 images from the test data set. Of the 18 images, only two of them were misclassified as indicated by the red titles. While it would be difficult to visually inspect thousands of images, there's still value in visually inspecting results in this way. If nothing else, to confirm the misclassifications makes sense. In the first row, we see that a ship was confused with an automobile, and in the last row, a green ship is confused with a frog. Both of these misclassifications are understandable given the images. However, this type of inspection might, more importantly, reveal a problem with the data set. There's lots of documented examples of corrupted data sets that were not discovered until somebody took a close look at the results. Let's now move on to the final section in which we produce a confusion matrix for the test data set. As discussed in a prior video, confusion matrix is a very common metric for assessing classification accuracy at the class level. It provides immediate visual feedback summarized for an entire data set and can be quite revealing. As a brief review, the information is presented in the form of a table or a matrix where one axis represents the ground truth labels for each class and the other axis represents the predicted labels from the model for each class. The entries in the table represent the total number of instances from an experiment, which are sometimes also represented as percentages rather than counts. Generating a confusion matrix in TensorFlow is accomplished by calling the confusion matrix function which takes two required arguments, the list of ground truth labels and the associated predicted labels. As we've seen before, a confusion matrix is a content-rich representation of a model's performance at the class level. And it can be very informative to better understand where the model performs well and where it may have more difficulty. For example, a few things stand out right away. Two of the 10 classes tend to be misclassified more than others, dogs and cats. More specifically, a large percentage of the time, the model confuses these two classes with each other. Let's take a closer look. The ground truth label for a cat is 3, and the ground truth label for a dog is 5. Notice that when the input image is a cat, it is often most misclassified as a dog, with 176 misclassified examples. When the input image is a dog, index 5, the most misclassified examples are cats, with 117 samples. Also notice that the last row, which represents trucks, is most often confused with automobiles. So all these observations make intuitive sense given the similarity of the classes involved. So that's all we wanted to cover in this video, but let's summarize the key points. We learned how to use TensorFlow and Keras to define and train a simple convolutional neural network. We showed that the model overfit the training data, and we learned how to use dropout layers to reduce the overfitting and improve the model's performance on the validation data set. We also covered how to save and load models to and from the file system. And finally, we reviewed three techniques used to evaluate the model on the test data set. We hope you found this video helpful. Thanks so much, and we'll see you next time.